Dream Tower Media presents The Literary Wonder and Adventure Show Hosted by Robert Zoltan With Edgar the Raven Howdy do This episode, Swords, a conversation with swordsman, teacher, and author, Guy Windsor. On guard! Hey! Ah! Come on, Edgar, is that all you have? Have at you, you hairless monkey. Have at you, rat catcher. Ha! You, you couldn't, couldn't skewer a cocktail, cocktail shrimp. Ali! Hey! 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 Lily coward! You call that fencing? It's more like knitting. Do your worst. Ha! Nice try, bird brain. Block this! Ah, DJ! Rock, red light, showtime! Showtime is right, have at you! Ah. Ah. Hello folks, welcome to the Dream Tower. Ah. Me and Edgar are just uh, brushing up on our swordsmanship in preparation for our host today. Ha! Ale! Ale! DJ! Our host today, Guy Windsor. Guy is a consulting swordsman, teacher, ah. and writer who has a... Ah who has a PhD in recreating historical martial arts. Ah. He researches <laughs> and teaches medieval and renaissance Italian swordsmanship <laughs> and runs the School of European Swordsmanship. <laughs> oh, hey, the dream phone. Go on, answer it. What? Answer the fin. But... Uh, Answer the fin. Uh, all right. Ha! Touché! <laughs> hey, that wasn't fair! Life isn't fair, my little black-feathered friend. Yeah, but swordsmanship should be. Answer the phone. Rock! Dream Tower Pizza. Hi, Edgar. This is Guy Windsor. Howdy do, Guy. Guy, how's it going? It's good, thanks. Yes, it's a beautiful summer day here in Ipswich. Um, yeah, I, I'm... Thinking you're probably also wondering how the the weather is in Russia right now. Um, do you follow the World Cup or? <laughs> I don't actually. I was in the gym. Um, I go to the gym occasionally because I have a deadlift bar that I can use. And there was this woman putting up bunting with these England flags on it. And I went over and I asked her what she was doing. <laughs> and she said, "Ah, oh, it's for the World Cup." And I said, "In what sport?" <laughs> and she said, "It's the football, isn't it?" I went, "Ah, oh, right. That explains a lot." Oh my um, gosh! So yes, that 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 is the level of my oblivion to you, football. You're def- definitely not a football fan, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, this, I know. this is the first time in what twenty tw- I... first tw- time in twenty eight years, I think they. Uh, I I wouldn't the, know the quarterfinal. Yeah. And you know what? The thing is, I hope England wins the whole thing for mm. one reason only. It's going to make a lot of people who live near me very happy, and right. happy people tend to be nicer. Okay. <laughs> you're right. Also, you know, after the Brexit nonsense, um, you know, the British economy isn't doing so great, and there's you know, companies going bust and or general sort of doom and gloom. And for whatever bizarre reason, some kind of glitch in the human psyche, some sports ball thing where mm-hmm. a bag crosses a line a few times yes. can actually cheer people up so much that it actually has a major impact on the economy. So 
for those reasons, well, go England. <laughs> as as uh, <laughs> as my show often do, does, going off on we haven't even talked about the, the use the word sword yet, because um, oh, okay. that's an interesting uh, that is an interesting uh, observation. Why why is it that that something like that, like you said, a, a, a basically a, well, I don't know what they're made of now. They're so high tech. When I played, it was actually leather, and the, yeah. the ball was heavier too. Because I found out like these balls, like they're getting so high tech and they're much lighter. I'm not sure yeah, what they're so made of. They get concussion. Yeah, oh, they're getting footballers like getting concussion and stuff oh, from wet leather balls. Really, oh, and, interesting. Yeah, because they're headbutting them into the into the goal. Right. And unlike American football, when there's a bunch of um, soccer players getting concussion, people actually did something about it quite quickly. Right. <laughs> um, in marked contrast. Well, and actually, that, that can I can I just riff on that a second? Sure. That actually brings up a really interesting point. It's the use of armor. Okay. Ah. And we see this in, in the practice of swordsmanship all the time, where people put their faith in armor in a way that isn't fair to the armor. Mm -hmm. So they assume I'm wearing a helmet, therefore my head will not get hurt. And mm -hmm. that just isn't true. You're wearing a helmet, which means that you'll be hitted different ways. And we saw the same thing with boxing, right? Mm -hmm. In old, old style bare knuckle boxing, mm -hmm. the fists were used to basically split the skin on the head. And okay, you get face shots, but when you're punching the, the head, you would end up um, trying to kind of um, imagine you had like little blades on your knuckles. You're trying to use your knuckles to sort of split the skin and make them bleed so the blood goes into their eyes. Right. But you wouldn't deliberately punch like a straight punch to the head um, with a bare fist because you break all your fingers. Right. Okay. So what happened was um, because, you know, the blood is unsightly, they invented these big mufflers, um, which became boxing gloves. So literally so that gentlemen could spar with each other without you know, marring their physical features. And when that kind of morphed over a hundred years into the sort of professional sport of boxing, you then have, uh, bare knuckle boxing is illegal because it's brutish mm -hmm. and um, gloved boxing is legal and very popular. And uh, so when you start punching people in the head with um, these mufflers on, that's when the brain gets shaken around and bad things happen. Which is why if you compare, for example, American football to rugby, you get far worse concussions in American football because they don't get that kind of surface impact that they really notice. They get this deeper impact, which causes concussions. Um, and is it, is it partly because they are deceived into believing that they're being protected by that helmet, so they head each other? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's why people kill themselves in cars mm -hmm. going ridiculous speeds because they feel safe going like 70 miles an hour down the road. Right, but when, you're, right, but when you start, your, your head suddenly stops from going <laughs> 70 to about 10 or zero, right. your brain is going happen. to smash into your skull. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, so... Um, but that's a really good, good way to start this. Is, so... Uh, the sword is obviously a weapon, but we're, we're, mm -hmm. uh, it, there's other... It, it goes much deeper than just being a weapon now. Uh, yeah, it's a symbol. But uh, let's go back to that. We started with... That's a very good place to start. It's just a human conflict, physical conflict. Um, yeah. People uh, first, when they got angry and wanted to hurt someone, they would just they would hit each other, obviously. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe they originally probably tried to strangle each other or punch yeah. each other or whatever. Kicking and punching, wrestling. Right, exactly. And then... Children do it. And then, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, actually, it could be a playful thing. It doesn't have to actually be to hurt someone exa exactly um, to build your physical strength. It's a natural uh, part of the physical uh, world. Yeah, and, and animals do it. I mean, right. like, watch lion cubs playing. They're mm -hmm. basically fighting each other. And they bite each Yes, and they bite each other, not hard enough to, like, yeah. hurt badly. So, and, and wrestle. Right. So that, so that started. And then the, 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 at some point, uh, uh, I'm, uh, Kubrick's uh, example in 2001, I'm sure, is not exactly what happened. <laughs> the, <laughs> Probably the not. The monkey guy, a guy grabbing the jawbone and suddenly unlocking all of humanity's troubles. Um, but but, but monkey, monkeys have been using... Monkeys use weapons, and tools. people have been using weapons since before there were people. I think. Yes, um, right. It's just natural. It's, and it's tools. a force multiplier. Right, and yeah, tools. Exactly. And, 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 and it's a just, a just a tool for hurting people. Exactly, a weapon is just a tool. So, um, so let's go back to that. So that developed, and um, I don't know how much of a knowledge of actual history you have in the sense of you know some. far back. Yeah, I, 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 same as me. Some. Um, what exactly people were using uh, 100,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago? I mean, I would assume that the earliest weapon um, and tools that were used were made of stone um, yep. and probably stone sharpened by harder stone. Um, and then so the oh, probably... Well, actually, when you're, mm -hmm. when you're flint napping, you don't usually use a harder stone. You use, um, basically, you kind of, kind of squeeze the flakes off. 
because flint flint splits along these beautiful curves so you get this lovely serrated edge um so yeah they, they take Sque- flint squeeze it with, squeeze it with what uh, well, these days, they tend to use a bit of copper, usually. I mean, flint napping isn't my thing, so flint nappers out there, feel free to r- send me an email to tell me I'm wrong. That's fine. Um, but I have friends who, who nap flint, and they're, they're not using a... I mean, flint's just about the hardest stone you can find. And they're not... They're, they bash them... They, they hit them in a particular way to make the flakes kind of kind of flake off, and then you've got this beautiful hard... But they hit them against me- metal now, but back then, what, you know, early... Uh, early. I, th- I think they use, they use a, a shaped rock to sort of chip the pieces off. Right. Um, oh, yeah. So they, it'd be the opposite, actually. I guess you would actually have a harder rock, and you would the rock you would be using to sharpen it might be softer, and it would be chewed up. Yeah. Right. I get you. Of course, I had it backwards. So, so that there was probably you know use of, and we I don't were air, arrows were pretty early or not? How? But now it's very early. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, the oldest the oldest bow surviving that I know of dates to about ten thousand BC. Hmm. Um, but there's no reason to think that it was new then. The problem is wood doesn't last underground. Right. Um, so we have lots of like arrowheads dating. Again, we're, we're way outside my period. My period really starts somewhere around 1300. So <laughs> right, when okay. we're talking like uh, you know, ancient history, we're sort of like, so again, um, yeah, I'm just, I may well yeah, be well, talking about it. Well, well, yeah, well we're, you know, we're not, I often say this, that, but myself and the other person that I'm talking with, we're not necessarily experts on everything that we're talking about. And that's not the point of the show, because there's, sure. there's always somebody smarter than you. I'm, I mean, yeah. the, the, the people I had on talking about Tolkien or Robert E. Howard, mm-hmm. were not, we're not, I wasn't interested in necessarily having the, the greatest expert in that person. You can find another show for that. I was, I was interested in having authors who were inspired that by that person. And that's how you find sure. out, to me, more insights about these things is by yeah. the passion you have. And of course, you have to have knowledge. And like you said, I understand your knowledge is probably more medieval times forward, yeah. but um, spears and arrows and just basic, simple, probably knives were the first weapons, right? Um, yeah, sticks and stones, then sharpened stones mm-hmm. attached to sticks, and then bent sticks throwing sharpened stones Clubs attached to and, small sticks. Yeah. Um, so you get range. And, you know, and when we look at like a medieval battlefield, you have bows and arrows, and you have, um, well, you also have. By the late medieval period, you've got some cannon as well, but you've you've got the same basic weapons used for piercing, weapons used um, for piercing at long distance, weapons used for clubbing. They're just fancier, and they're made of steel instead of right more, um, more stone and wood. Right, more sophisticated. Um, and yeah. and that was pretty much the case until the advent of gunpowder and uh, the use of yeah, it but too. but they were still using swords sure. to good effect in the battlefields in the nineteenth century. Right. So, no, no, I'm just saying that that was the only that was yeah. the big change in weaponry was yeah, yeah. explosives, I guess. Um, yeah, and then the next major change after that was aircraft. Right. I would say. So so let's go back. Let's go back and uh, move forward from the kind of glacial. I, the Ice Age, ten thousand BC, and uh, okay. um, what do you know? Because I, I, I have read a little bit about this, but my memory is a little foggy. When was the first the sword first swords created in the Bronze Age? Then, well, we we certainly have plenty of Bronze Age swords um, that have survived. And I've actually handled one from about three thousand BC. Wow, um, that's the oldest metal sword I've handled, and um, before that, they may have been made of copper but it wouldn't they wouldn't have been very good if they were mm-hmm. um i seem to recall reading somewhere about copper swords but i you know copper is just a rubbish metal for that when they started mm-hmm. mixing copper with tin and getting bronze that actually makes a pretty good blade and you can get um basically about as good an edge with bronze as you can get from iron bronze is uh mixing copper and tin you said is that right yeah interesting that's interesting because tin is, is known as such a kind of a, a weak metal, isn't it? But it's when you mix them together, it changes. Yeah, the... when you mix, yeah, copper and tin separately are you know, not that useful for making things out of. Um, when you mix them together and you make bronze, they, they create an alloy which is just really good for pots and for shields and for blades. I mean, it's not in the same class as steel for blades, but it's certainly in the same class as iron. Yeah, I used to fence, which is oh, right, okay. di- different, uh, of course, different. Because, yeah. And one of my complaints about fencing back then, I, I eventually became moved from foil to saber. Yeah. Um, but even back then, I just felt like I'd rather be doing this with a real saber because the weapons had become sure. so light yeah, that absolutely. it's crazy. I mean, I, I fought a guy one time and it was one of those brutal you know, lessons where you're mm-hmm. learning and you're fighting someone that's just so far superior. And... Uh, 
Those are the best fights. Well, yeah, for, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, well, for, for it, learning it, purposes, it hurt. The best <laughs> well, it was yeah, yeah, I no. definitely learned, but what I was, the, the, the reason, well, the reason it hurt so much is what I'm talking about. The, the blades being so light this guy was uh he was a sparring partner for a guy who was nationally ranked right and we're and i'm about to fight him we're gonna go to 25 points and it's like i know i'm gonna get my butt kicked yeah. you, you and, don't look like you had a visit to the dominatrix oh my gosh that's the thing is the blades are so the, the saber is so light yeah that i'm it's wearing like basically it's a riding crop you know what it's like a whip i'm wearing all yeah. this stuff i'm wearing the plaster i'm wearing the helmet it's got the padding back there but when he hits me, the blade is so light that it's whipping like a whip That's around right. and he's hitting yeah. me. I had I had blue marks in my back. I had a blue mark. One of them hit me. Unfortunately, my head had been tilted forward and it got under my uh, uh, the padding on the the helmet behind my oh neck. But I had I was literally tears by halfway through. Tears were already flowing from my eye from the pain. Yeah. I had five or six blue spots, yeah. and I had to keep going. I think I lost twenty five to eight or something. It was mm -hmm. quite painful. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would have rather have been using heavier saber, have more padding on. Yes. It's, al it's almost like what you said about the football thing. That's right. We've got the protection, so everything's fine. And here's this little blade. It's whipping and it's, it's hitting you through this padding and it's not protecting you. Yeah. I, um, again, with, with more rigid blades, they come with their own problems, but mm -hmm. that problem goes away. But then instead of getting, you know stripes that go away in a day or two you can get your arm broken i was going to say or get real um, rib broken or, or ribs broken or yeah and you know there, there have been some accidents on the reenactment field that don't even bear talking about because it's yeah it's just so horrible wow um, i mean so one of the things that we have to do uh, in practice is um, moderate the level of force to the level of the student and to moderate the equipment as well so we we wear um, unhistorical equipment so that we can hit each other in historical ways. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a technique that works beautifully against a person who is bare-faced, if you train it bare-faced as is historical, you can't do that technique without blinding somebody. So we wear unhistorical masks to protect the face so that we can do the historical technique of striking the face. But I suppose when they were training, with, did they wear... Well, um, the fencing mask was invented, I want to say, around 1700. Mm. And after that, it became quite popular. Uh, but it used to be said that you could identify a fencing master from the fact that he had one eye and no front teeth. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, actually, they, they were a lot, a lot, they trained a lot more safely than, you, than you'd imagine. I mean, even back in like German uh, fencing schools of the 16th century, they would fight, you know, one school would challenge another school and they would have these competitions and the way to win was um, a proper bleeding head wound hmm. wow. right but people weren't usually getting killed mm -hmm. that was unusual i mean people yeah. get killed doing sport fencing occasionally it's mm -hmm. rare mm -hmm. and what do they do almost invariably they change the equipment right whereas what they ought to be doing is changing the rules hmm. you know just just imagine this as a thought experiment you're driving down the road in your car and there's a big shiny steel spike sticking out of the steering wheel yeah. right at your chest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're not allowed a seatbelt. Mm -hmm. How fast would you be willing to drive? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it changes everything. I'd, so, be, I'd, be, we, I'd be taking the train. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and we, you know, we, do, we do training with sharp swords in my school, mm -hmm. which um, when we're doing stuff with sharp swords, um, it's actually we're much less likely to have an accident because the swords are actually really scary. But when you're doing... So you, you, why, would you, why would you practice with sharp swords since it's just a... Oh, um, okay. The reason we practice with sharp swords is uh, firstly because the techniques that we're studying are supposed to work with sharp swords. Mm -hmm. And to be sure that, they, that we're getting the interpretation right enough that it would work we have to test it with sharp swords. So mm -hmm. it's partly, it's that. Partly also... Um, because the blades run along each other differently when they're sharp. Exactly. They're so sharp blades, when they come together, they tend to stick mm. and blunt blades tend to slide off each other. That's something okay. that people are deceived about watching the movies and stuff they probably don't right. realize, yeah. Another thing is the psychology of it. Things you are willing to do against your friend with a blunted sword while you're wearing a mask are completely different to things you're willing to do against your friend holding a sharp sword, mm -hmm. right? So it, it changes the psychology of the interaction. Also, there is the kind of the spiritual development aspect of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And 
by doing it with sharps, you have to get into a different mindset altogether. It's not play. It's not fun. Mm-hmm. It's, well, it's great fun, but it's it's like going to a shooting range. Right. Um, I, I shoot pistols, and in a shooting range, every now and then you do get an idiot, but generally speaking, everyone is serious. Everyone is paying attention, even when they're having fun. Mm-hmm. The guns always point down range. They're always left open if they're not in your hand. You, you know, it's it's a different... It's a completely different feeling to paintball. And right. both are good. Both have their place. You know, laser tag and paintball are great for like group tactics and various other things. Mm-hmm. But for actually shooting a proper gun, there's no substitute for live firing. Okay. And the same is true for training swordsmanship. There is no substitute to using an actual sharp sword that mm-hmm. will cut you if you make a mistake. Mm-hmm. So there's that. So when you're where, when you are, uh, fighting with sharp swords what mm-hmm. what do you wear to protect yourself are you wearing leather armor okay well we don't fight with sharp swords oh just oh. that that would be very dangerous <laughs> um we so just, tr- just you mean just training moves to try to replicate the techniques of the yeah old so masters. so that there are lots of different kinds of practice um what most people think of when you think of martial arts training is blocked practice where you do the same technique over and over again with the same feed and the same response and it's very rigid and it's regimented and that's sort of the starting point. Um, with blunt swords and plenty of protection, we'll go, we'll add complexity up to the point where we're just simply trying to hit each other or throw each other on the ground or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's it's basically competition. Mm-hmm. Um, with the sharps, we do the blocked practice, and we do limited additional complexity. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes we'll do basically what's the light sparring should we call it Mm -hmm. with sharp swords Mm -hmm. because you know this is very experienced people usually like 10 years of training or more Mm -hmm. um who are both you know consenting adults and they know they're doing something where somebody makes a mistake the other one could die um but that's that's also true when you get in a car and drive down the road if you make a mistake someone could die Mm -hmm. so people take that sort of responsibility very casually after they've learned to drive by doing it deliberately and responsibly in a training hall with sharp swords, you're making it much more conscious and deliberate. And I would argue you're much less likely to make a fatal mistake than you are when you've sort of forgotten how dangerous it all is. Yes, I think that's a that's an excellent point. Personal responsibility is something that's just become like a thing of the past. I, and this brings up this law. Wasn't there a law recently? In, in uh, I think Martin. Oh, by the way, I want to shout out to Martin Page. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes, Martin Page, who was so uh, kind to refer me to you because I was going to have Martin on the sh- on the show. And as a, a gallant gentleman, he thought that you had more information on this subject. So I want to have Martin on a, a, a future show instead. But hello. yeah, you, you must because because he okay. When it comes to the history, Martin is a way better historian than I am. I, I focus on the on the swords more and the history less. He does the history more and the swords less. And he, he's also a really good writer. Yeah, he didn't he didn't make it sound that way. I think he was being humble. But I'm gonna get him. <laughs> I'm gonna get him on here. Um, Do so. Hello, Martin. Um, so this brings up the, I don't know if you posted or someone a concern about some kind of law in Britain about not being able to have weapons and is was that going to affect? Swords? Oh, they're, they're always bringing because the problem is uh, teenagers keep knifing each other mm-hmm. and. The usual response by politicians is, well, something must be done. And, you know, insert stupid option A. Get rid of stupid knives. Stupid option A <laughs> is something and therefore will do stupid option A. Right. And so one of the things they recently thought of is you can't buy knives over the Internet. OK. That's um, I, th- I think there's actually they've got a, a proviso in there that if it's a custom made knife, you can. Um, so, you know, like... Um, my knife smithing friends are kind of covered by that. But the thing is, it's completely stupid because you have to have knives. Knives, you, right. you can't cook without knives. You can't do carpentry without knives. You, you know, there are so many things that you need a blade for that the idea of banning blades is just stupid. <clears throat> well, I guess uh, um, if, they, if, they, if, they ban it, if they ban it online, it'll bring back the, the in-person kitchen industry then. People have to go to the store well, to buy them. Great. Knives. Yeah, exactly. And... <laughs> And, and see, you're always going to be able to, you're always going to be able to buy them. So, it's the so sim- the idea of having leaving a paper trail by ordering it on the internet, it's just stupid. well, it's the it, 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 like you said. Well, then here's the, the problem: is this 
the politicians want to get reelected or whatever. I don't mean to sound mm-hmm. too, too cynical, but also it's a very difficult the problem. Is, so let's see, should we try to should we try to solve the problem of human behavior or just get rid of the knives? So they try to right. get rid of the knives, but it really doesn't solve anything. Sure. And we keep avoiding the the difficult problem, which is how do you transform society so that yeah. people don't want to kill each other? I sound almost like Shatner for a second there. I paused. I had a moment. I <laughs> kill each other. Uh, yes, I, I yes, didn't even yes, mean yes. to you, do that. You were channeling Captain. Yeah, Kirk I was. There. there was an episode or the, a taste of Armageddon. Do you remember that when they the two the two uh, on the planet the two uh, warring yes. they're killing each other through computers and they walk into the cha- right. cha- yeah, chamber yeah, 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 and, get, yeah, yeah. And, and and allow yes. themselves to be disintegrated so that they can preserve their culture. There's no bombs. There's no real weapons. They do it yeah. all through computer. And if it shows that you get killed, you walk in and you. That's almost yes. like that was a perfect. That was that. That's a great great uh, episode to show that kind of the mental the crazy mentality of yeah. you and Star Trek is is so underappreciated in the wider world I think I think for, the, the, I mean, old, it, the old it, one was it, I think for sure yeah yes. it does it does things like that I mean and it's, it's astonishing it's, it's, astonishing episode yeah how do you transform society so that people don't want to kill each other that's a huge question then well, you gotta start well, we going to have have what? we already have rates of violence are massively lower than they were a hundred years ago yeah. Oh sure. Um, yeah. And and that's been going on that's been going on for the last five hundred years. There's a brilliant book about it by Stephen Pinker called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Are you talking about uh, is this a, you know, including warfare and everything? Or are you talking about cr- yeah. crime? Yeah, yeah. Or? Oh, including oh, yeah. warfare yeah. and everything. Yeah. Well. Um, and he says that the rates of interpersonal well, should we say death by murder in tribal societies is often around twenty five percent. Wow. Um, compare that to in the First World War. Um, total deaths around amounted to about 10% of the total number of combatants. So if you signed up, you had a 10% chance of getting killed. But guy, there was an awful lot of um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. people. I mean, there were millions and millions of people getting killed. No, no question about it. I mean, it when you take 10, yeah, 10%, 10% of like but, millions but when, is like, oh. But when, but when you run the numbers, as, as he does in his book, it does turn out that you know. Yeah, I'm not nece- not necessarily in disagreement with this theory. However, <clears throat> couldn't the the lower percentage just be attributed to something else other than human nature being better? Uh, no, no, he doesn't. He doesn't attribute it to human nature getting better. He attributes it attributes it to society getting better at bottling violence up. But isn't and, isn't that a sense? Isn't that in a sense human nature in getting better by learning what it's like and and therefore um, changing? No, things? no, because the 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 mechanism that he ascribes. Um, as the cause is the state taking a monopoly on violence. In other words, only the state can kill people. Only the state can lock people up. All that sort of thing. And that he's um, that's he he's for that idea. He believes that. Is, well, he he thinks that that, 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 that works. began it began in like the 14th century and it just got got more and more. Um, it got stricter and stricter and stricter over time. He thinks that that's what led to the massive diminutions in violence. And mm. that's why, incidentally, um, when when somebody gets murdered, it used to be that if their family didn't do anything about it, nothing got done. Now, if somebody gets murdered, and for the last several hundred years, if somebody gets murdered, the state takes an interest. It's the crown that prosecutes in the UK, and mm. it would be the state that prosecutes in America. Right. Right. It's not be- the person's family. Right. Because, Which, because otherwise because you would have... Up- yeah, 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 because you have violated the state's monopoly on lethal violence, and the and the and the state's uh, purpose and hope is to put an end to this violence, therefore to, right. to keep the structure of society stable. But with exactly. uh, with families, they you it's like Romeo and Juliet. It's like exactly know, it goes and, on forever. Yeah, and what stopped that was that the two came together, and yeah, in, in, in a sense, what if the and the Capulets and the Montagues then came together into one family? You start to almost have a government. So that's it, yeah. it is the similar thing. Once you get a lot of people together, the more people you get together, the less you can kill each other that way. Because pretty soon, yeah, it gets very chaotic. Yes, and even if you are killing only ten percent, look how many people get killed. It becomes very serious, and everyone's affected. It's like some uh, someone was saying to me talking about, oh, we have to keep up with China about our military here and how spending. And I said, our military spending is so crazy. We could destroy the world over like 15 times. And they said, oh, we have to keep up with China, though. And I'm thinking, keep up with China. No, China, China owns part of our debt. 
I have so many Chinese friends. There's so many Chinese people here. They they own a lot of real yeah. estate. How they why you think China would attack the United States? They they own part of the United States and most of, like, millions of their people. It would people destroy China's economy because the debt would go to go to hell straight away. It makes no yeah. sense. The world's too. You can't think that way anymore. Yeah. The world's just so small. Look at the world. Look at the world. You don't watch the World Cup. Look at the World Cup. I mean, I'm watching. Yeah, sure. I'm watching. Um, uh, Russia and I'm watching their fullback uh, Fernandez <laughs> on, okay. on on the right. Russian team. Yeah, on the Russian yeah. team. I mean, and it's not just the club teams because the club teams are not completely international, but the yeah. actual national teams. Yes, they're all from all over the place. You know, it's just everything. The walls are coming down. Um, yeah, the chaos is different now. It's all mixed in. Another example of this is how dueling fell out of fashion. It became, it you know, you know people have been dueling since forever. It's, mm -hmm. it's been a standard way of, of establishing status within a hierarchy since forever. Um, but sometime around the end of the 18th century, it was falling out of fashion. And by the middle of the 19th century, people had just basically stopped doing it. But had it wasn't, Certainly in Europe. wasn't dueling even the first step towards trying to put an end to a, a yeah. stop? Well, yeah, it, it, it's a, exactly, it was, a, yeah, it was a stable way of duel. I'm going to duel you instead of our families all fighting and killing. I'm going right. to represent this. You're going and, to represent And the, the, critical, the critical factor in that is that by showing up to the duel, both parties establish themselves as honorable. Right. So it doesn't matter who wins in, in that sense. Your honor is restored when you show up. If you win, great. And if you lose, Bad luck. Well, that's interesting. But your honor is restored just by showing up. I didn't and that's know that. a really critical point. Yeah. Because it's not about well, okay, to the combatants, obviously it's about the winning. Mm -hmm. But the the bad blood between them, the the offense that has caused the problem, like maybe one person was rude to another or whatever, mm -hmm. that is, at least in theory, wiped out by them meeting. And of course, there are plenty of examples in history of people dueling each other over and over again. Mm -hmm. Until one of them eventually gets killed. Yeah, um, and that was not the purpose. Because, usually, to, to but that was not the purpose. Get, the purpose yeah. was it's a, it's like a, a little safe little petri dish where you can you can do the thing, and nobody outside that nobody outside the dueling ground is actually directly affected. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so it it stops it being family against family, and it becomes person against person. And when somebody's been cut or killed or shot or whatever or both pistols have been fired or whatever however it turns out mm -hmm. honor is satisfied and it moves on and with swords probably there was a little bit more chance of surviving and the, the point was often just uh, first blood drawn was uh, or no yeah, okay well it varied a great deal but the, the thing about swords um is a pistol ball can go anywhere mm -hmm. but a sword is bound to go somewhere right so a lot of pistol duels Nobody got hit. Right. Sometimes deliberately, sometimes not. And yes, of course, people. And the guns, also the got guns, killed. and the guns weren't as accurate either. Were they? Yeah, and even yeah. when more accurate guns were available, they didn't tend to be used. Mm -hmm. Right. Because again, that's the point: is you stand your enemy's fire, and by doing so, you establish yourself as honourable. Mm -hmm. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Whether anybody actually gets hit or not isn't the point. I would imagine there were a lot of times when both people side a nice sigh of relief when they both missed <laughs> oh yeah and and there's even there's even a word for missing deliberately it's called deloping deloping okay yeah i see so so uh, uh deloping so that'd be kind of like the opposite of eloping so like <laughs> i guess yeah. deloping deloping, you, deloping you agree to miss each other eloping you just you, you agree to shoot each other <laughs> <laughs> well no, i think again critically important you cannot agree to delope beforehand without no, because right. if you did that, there's no it's honor. not a duel. Right. There's no honor in that. Right. You show up and you may choose to aim at your opponent and you there's no there's no sanction if you do. And you may choose to delope. Mm -hmm. Um and there is again no you know, there's no no sanction if you do that, but actually deloping was, was sometimes considered to be a bit not quite the done thing. Not quite the what? Not quite the done thing. Mm hmm So it was not um, not approved? Of? Uh, yes, sometimes, yeah. It was considered to be maybe a little bit, I don't know, not quite. You Basically, you're not really necessarily giving your opponent the the proper 
opportunity to display his Courage. manly vigor by standing still while you shoot at him. Well, surely, like that, well, sure, <laughs> surely, him showing up and not knowing that you're going to delope yeah, has yeah, already yeah. proves it, his courage. And when, when yeah. you say deloping, would to do they fire into the air, or you mean actually they act like they're going to shoot at him, but they barely miss him on purpose? Um, the difference usually, between those two. Uh, uh, deloping. The only way you can be sure it's a delope is if they're clearly pointing the pistol somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, it's just a bad shot. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But you know, but the no, ult- no one wants a reputation as a bad shot. Yes, but the ult- yeah, true. But that would be the ultimate enlightened honor. Would be you point at the guy and just, just you you just veer it off a bit. You know, you're not going to shoot him in that way. It really looks like he stood there. And yeah. But that's uh, to me, that's kind of sad that deloping would be considered not looked on favorably unless the guy was hoping to do it just hoping the guy other guy wouldn't shoot at him too but to me that would show, show the almost the ultimate courage to to that you're going to shoot the that you're willing to face his whatever his decision is and and an offer and, a, and a, an amazing peace offering too in a sense yeah so we 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 we've already gone past swords into into bullets <laughs> yes. but, so, so swords are what i do we can get back to swords anytime <laughs> well that's okay when was steel developed i'm afraid i'm a little bit ignorant of that uh, it's been around for a really long time. I forget exactly like how old. Like three, four hundred AD or later. Oh uh, no, BC. I really? Steel? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. um, I didn't realize. A little before Roman era. Yeah, the Romans were using steel weapons. Right, that's what I thought. Um, I'm not sure exactly when when they became um, sort of uh, common. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I think, I think it's somewhere around 300 BC, something like that, that it started to be developed. I think steel was extremely expensive. Uh, yeah. And forgive my ignorance. What's the difference between iron and steel? Oh, steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. Okay. And basically what happens is iron is, is quite tough and difficult to break, but it's, it's fairly soft. Oh, okay. um, and when you, when you heat it up and you mix it with carbon and you bash it about a bit, the uh, iron um, atoms organize themselves around the carbon atoms mm-hmm. into a kind of matrix mm-hmm. that's, that's quite consistent. And in a, re- in a perfect piece of steel, the distribution of carbon is perfectly even mm-hmm. and you get something that is almost indestructible. Um, the, the point of it is that you can harden it Um, because most materials are either hard or tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So wood is quite tough. Bronze is quite tough. um, Glass is hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. Um, But steel, you can make both um, hard and tough. So you have an edge that will, that you can harden, sharpen. So it's hard enough that you can make it very sharp. Hard and durable. Right. Yeah, exactly. Hard and durable. And it allows you to make um, longer blades. And you can also make steel flexible so that it can take some bend without staying bent. Yes. And also, and then, and I've seen like some of the designs of, did they often, they, they often would scoop out kind of the very middle of the blade and that made oh, it, oh yeah, yeah. And then that, that's, that made it lighter. That's sort of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So was that yeah, Vi- the, point, the Vikings the did of, that? I'm not sure if those did. Oh, yeah, that's been around since Roman times. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. there are some beautiful spathers, which are these straight Roman cavalry swords, mm-hmm. which have like five grooves mm-hmm. from um, the hilt to quite close to the point. Mm-hmm. And the point of those is, uh, yes, it makes the whole sword lighter, but it also changes its cross section, making it more rigid for less weight. So mm. you get you get a blade that handles much better if you if you shape it in a particular way. Mm-hmm. Um, but so there's there's good sort of structural reasons why you'd put them into a blade right so moving on to the yeah. your era i mean um i write uh these these stories the rogues of mirth um mm-hmm. series Dar- darian and darian vin and uh blue and darian uses a rapier and i, I also I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an illustrator so I, I bought a book on on uh rapiers and and other swords uh, so I want to find out what kind of blades you're using and what, and cause, uh-huh. cause a rapier is not known to be actually, that wasn't that favorite of a weapon. They were talking about, a lot, there's a lot of weaknesses to it, but the, the hand, the hand guards became crazy, <laughs> so ornate and yeah. fantastic. What is art? I hate when I have to illustrate, I have Darian holding a sword and if I have to do a painting, it's like, oh God, no, cause it's curving. The, the cause, yeah. you know, well, there's ones that were like in Hollywood, they used the bell guard. That wasn't, that wasn't that popular. Um, and then there was the ones that had very like perforated screens. And then there yeah. was ones that had, that I think are the most beautiful that I usually try to illustrate was those, those curving hand guards. 
And, yes. Uh, so tell me what, tell me, talk to me a little bit about the development of, I guess, the rapier came from the long sword, if that's the proper term for it, and what you use, and tell me, talk about that era. Okay, well, I, I use, I, I, my, my period spreads from about 1300 to about 1800, so I use long swords and side swords and rapiers and small swords and cavalry savers and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so... Basically, what happened around the middle of the 16th century, should we say 1560s, 1570, is um, the sword became optimized for dueling out of armor in an illegal context. Hmm. Okay. Prior to that, um, the swords were mostly used for, uh, well, for dueling, yes, but if they were dueling, it would normally be in public in a legal context mm -hmm. okay and there would usually be some kind of armor being worn okay right. which changes what you want to do mm -hmm. so um they became like a sort of arms race how long can you make your sword before it becomes droopy mm -hmm. right? <laughs> oh man so, oh, so by boy. about six for about by about 1600 you can find Sexual you can find reading. rapiers with blades 50 inches long <laughs> oh my god right they're incredibly long but but size and, but well, we all know the size is not the thing that matters right it's how, well quite it's exactly. how, how you it's use the you blade yeah <laughs> that's right um no <gasps> most of my my rapier blade is about uh well i have several so we're talking about say, swords now right we're talking about swords now talking <laughs> about swords, yeah. my rapier blade is about 42 to 45 inches long depending on what style i'm doing and how i'm doing it mm -hmm. 45 is very long for me uh 42 is nice and comfortable mm -hmm. um there was a very famous uh, Excuse me, I just want to ask, and yeah. is, is that measuring from the beginning of the blade itself? Yeah, okay. that's measuring from like the cross guard where you put your finger over mm -hmm. to the point. And there was a very famous edict by Queen Elizabeth I um, who decreed that within the, the walls of London, you're not allowed a sword that's more than 36 inches. Um, the blade is no more than 36 inches. So you actually have um, rapiers that exist, which are 36 inches from cross guard to point, but the but the handle, sorry, f for, um, the handle is actually, has the blade going down into the pommel, but there's a sort of spring arrangement. So when you draw the sword out, it, out to have it measured, it's 36 inches from cross guard to point. But then when you actually want to fight with it, you can kind of pull it out a bit and you get another like four inches. Oh my God. <laughs> right? That's just it's crazy. That's, see, you, it's try crazy. To, you try to pass laws and people always find a way around it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so the, the rapier, I'm just, so I'm guessing maybe from what you said, the rapier probably was not really that effective a weapon at used against somebody that had armor on. Uh, Unless you stab, I guess piercing is the main. Well, the thing is, you, you, you can find um, swords specifically designed for fighting against a man in armor that are a lot like a rapier, mm -hmm. right? They are they're called estocks. There's a beautiful one in the Wallace collection, um, which has a blade... Um, the one in the Wallace collection I'm thinking of has a blade like an epée blade, only it's about maybe an inch and a half wide at the cross guard. So let's, uh, let's stop real quick there because I was a fencer, I know. So an epée, yeah. what for people that are listening, epée blade is a usually a fairly large, long blade that that is that is uh, tr triangular. Triangular, yes, triangular in cross section, mm -hmm. and it's hollow ground. Mm -hmm. So you get rid of a lot of metal, but you still have that triangular cross section that makes it rigid. And it's a large, usually a longer blade is that not or is that only um, in fencing i think i think no i think foils and epées are about the same length. yeah in, fen in, anyway. in fencing i think they're a little longer but go ahead uh so you, okay. you're so what was the weapon you were talking about would you call it um it's an s-stock s-stock which is yeah or a tuck mm -hmm. um s-stock is the french word and and tuck is the english word mm -hmm. um and it's basically a spike for getting in, into the gaps of the armor right but mm -hmm. the thing is you wouldn't normally carry that as a side as a sidearm because it's, it's super specialized for dealing with men in armor. It's much less good at dealing with annoying peasants. Right, you would, you, um, you would, that would be used probably in warfare where you knew you were taking... Actually, no, I think more, more likely to be in, in a, a judicial dueling context because oh, really? in warfare, you don't really know what you're gonna come up against. And, and the, sword, the sword is very rarely um, the primary weapon for um, Warfare, especially the, foot soldiers, yeah, you know, spear, right. spears, spears so, more like. And, and knights on horseback will normally have a lance, right? Um, and only when the lance is broken, 
do you end up, or, or if things get too close, do you pull your sword out and carry on? Now, let me ask you this, because that, that yeah. brings up an interesting point, because I thought I read someplace that obviously the lance would be a, or spear would be a good for a, you, on a horse if you had mm-hmm. room to operate. But I, I thought I had read that one of the developments of the sword had to do with that it was a, it was a great weapon to use from horseback. Is that not true? Um, well, yeah, the sword is a, is a great weapon to use from horseback when you're in close quarters. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why we see, for example, the Roman gladius is a short weapon to use with a shield on foot, but the spatha is about twice as long. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's you know for use on horseback, so you can reach down far enough to right. hit the people who are standing on the ground. Yeah, you're, yeah, horses are... A lot of people that don't ride, I mean, and nowadays, I mean, most people have never even been around a horse, probably. Yeah. Horses are large animals. You're, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, you're way up there. You're, when you're on top yeah. of a horse, even a small... It's a long way to the ground. Yeah. Although, interestingly enough, um, war horses were, uh, they're almost invariably illustrated as being quite small animals. Mm, interesting. Um, like, sometimes so small that the, you can see the rider's feet below the horse's belly. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe 14, 15 hands, basically ponies, mm-hmm. more like polo ponies. Interesting. Which, mm. given that you want a maneuverability, that makes sense. Um, when you get to like 19th century, sort of, should we say 1815, um, Napoleon's heavy cavalry, then you've got big men on big horses. But generally speaking, most, most of my equestrian friends who do medieval combat, um, they see, all seem to agree that the the knight's horse would tend to have been their trained war horse would tend to have been quite small. Uh, reasons for that? Uh, I think maneuverability. Yeah, and also I guess I mean people don't realize that you know if somebody's coming at you, forget the chivalry. People would cut the horse's legs out from under them if they had to, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, and, and yeah. if you have a really tall horse and the guy has his way up there, <laughs> it's vulnerable. he's trying to. Re- yeah. yeah, it's just more vulnerable, right? People always think about some big giant warrior with this giant weapon. It's mm. like, man, you got to be able. Well, did you ever see uh, uh, one of my favorite, uh, though, could be said is not a fantasy movie, the historical fantasy in a way, is uh, the Thirteenth um, uh, Warrior. Oh God! Yes, I saw that. When film. when when the oh, when, when the small oh, no. when the smaller Viking, uh, the, well, they have the duel. Do you remember that part? Yeah, I, I've I've blocked it from my. You mind. You don't like the movie? It, it was well, I watched it. I think probably fifteen years ago mm. on video, but, and yeah. It, what don't what don't you, what don't you like about it? Um, well, okay, I was watching it with a friend of mine who is. Okay, he is so serious about his historical oh, no. reenactment well, that's kit. Just... That, 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 no, 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 <laughs> but that, you know, he he hand weaves his own cloth and that kind of stuff. Right. So it's done properly, right? right, right. You know. and, and you know, we enjoyed it as 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 an hour and a half of foolishness. Well, that, we... well that's I call it historical fantasy. I don't look on it as right. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Uh, I'm not. I, I don't mean to diss the movie, and there's nothing wrong with having fun <laughs> in the movie. That's perfectly fine. But I don't actually remember any bit of it because there was no reason to watch any part of it again. Oh, oh boy, we feel differently about that one. I lo- <laughs> yeah, I, oh, sure. I love that movie. But but see, oh, I, right, I, yeah, I'm not. Um, well, okay, for me, you, you know tell what? Me I, love it. Let, I will watch it again. Let me tell you. I'll watch it again. Let, and I'll let you know. Let me tell you how I feel about these things. Though. Go ahead. This is interesting. So I'm having, and th- I say this. This is a good uh, transition. I want to move into the the symbolic meaning of this or why is the sword mm-hmm. there's the question one of the main questions i want to ask after i i'll go back to this after we'll go back to after i make the comment about the 13th warrior yeah one of the most important questions i want to ask is why is the sword so is the most famous weapon in the world i mean you could okay. say a gun I, I have is answers now, but, for that. okay good we'll get that so a 13th warrior but for me okay as as yeah, a writer he, and he, a, as he a, ground that big sword down into a small sword who did? Into a saber or something? Yes, he took a great big oh, Viking sword oh, that. and he ground oh, it into a saber. Oh, it's like, oh, no, oh, no, do you not know what those swords are made I, of? I didn't do you believe, not know I, how they're made? It's like, I didn't believe. Ah! I didn't believe that for a second either. Ah! That's interesting. You'd that, bring that up. That, that was the only one that I did that didn't. But that's see, that's to me total fantasy. That's just that's a romantic fantasy. But good, but good fantasy is grounded is in reality. Based, is grounded in reality. So, I so for example, saying. yes, right. I mean, uh, Viking swords of that period they tend to be made of uh, pattern welded steel so you've got usually iron and steel in kind of layers twisted up and they make beautiful things and then they weld a steel edge all the way around right. and the whole thing is a glorious piece of of fantastically high level craftsmanship if you then grind a curved blade out of it all you know, the bit of the sword that's supposed to do the cutting is made of the right sort of steel for that the rest of it isn't no so when you no. grind it like that what you get is basically a club 
Yeah, he would have had to, he would have had to re, that would have, that would have been, he would have had to melt the metal down and reforge the sword. Yeah, I'll reforge it. That yeah. would have been believable. I I'd forgotten that, but yeah, the, what would have been believable oh, is he oh, just sorry, sorry. Speaking of mm-hmm. um, uh, steel dates back. The oldest piece of steel known is four thousand years old mm-hmm. from eighteen hundred BC. The, the steel and wow. steel, yes, and um, they there were areas in. Um, the Indian subcontinent, Sri Lanka and places like that, that were producing a kind of high carbon steel already in the 6th or 7th century BC. You know, Ga- that old. Yeah, Ga- 6th or 7th century BC. See, yeah. this is, Guy, this is the point I want to make. I've forgotten I was talking about a scientist being too orthodox. Once you get to a certain point in history, the reason we don't have evidence of things is because they don't last. Mm. We're so used to recording, like, you know, people putting on Facebook what they had for lunch. You know, yeah. in 2,000 years, God for God for, for knows for what reason someone would want to know. They'll be able to know what somebody had for lunch, you know, right now. Yeah. But, but back then, the reason we don't have traces of some of these civilizations is because they're under the water and they don't last. And, yeah. they, and they're looking at the ruins outside Japan and they look so man-made. But the geologist's like, well, it could have been formed. It was this and that. And Graham Hancock came up with this ama- the amazing just realization look, by, by studying the Japanese ruins that they know are man-made by the Jomen, the oldest Japanese people, they did, it wasn't one or the other. They carved into existing natural structures. Right. So it looked, you, you couldn't tell sometimes barely. And if, and once Which so much, was. yeah, and so much, so much time passes, marks on the stone have been worn away. So, yeah. and the same thing with weapons, it's like steel's durable, but before that, like you, like well, you said. Well, steel rusts. Oh, it, that's true. Steel does rust. What's rust, the, what, rust co- nothing. That's strange. Actually, bronze is more durable then, right? Much more durable. Yeah. yeah. How, how str- but, you know, who knows? They could have been making weapons before that, and the sword could have been around for a long time, and we wouldn't have a, evidence of them until um, the Bronze Age because of bronze being durable. But that was just a point, I, a side point I wanted to make. I don't sure. want to make that point back then, and I'd forgotten. Because I think that we're just so used now, we're so used to things... Being recorded. Be, being recorded, not lasting, but being recorded. So we get this idea that, well, if there was something, we would have writing, we would have this. Well, of course, a, yeah, lot, I mean, of, a lot of people the, didn't write either. The Joman people didn't write. So you don't have the, any... The, the, stand, the standard sort of truism is absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right. Very, very true. And that's why we have mystery, which we, I think we all enjoy. I do. Yeah. <laughs> and that gets me back to the 13th War of what I enjoyed about those things yeah. is the uh, the sense of uh, the, the, the romance and the mystery of the movie. Personally, going back into like even what I write as a writer and reader in my Rogues of Mirth stories, honestly, most uninteresting part I am so uninterested in combat. Not not thoroughly interested in combat. You know the what? details of the combat. The me too. Really me interesting. Too. In, in fiction, in fiction, I am. Yes. I generally speaking, the mistake people make when writing fiction is they try and write it like a boxing commentator who is commenting for a very knowledgeable audience. Oh, I, like I'm, I'm technical s- terms yes. and jargon and stuff. So I, with I, you, I, I'm so with you. And with historical fiction, it's like battle after battle after battle. I don't care. I know. I want to know, you know, I want to what know the, happens? the character and <laughs> yeah. and why it's important to yes. them, not just what yes. what all happened. Yes. I want to know why it matters that mm-hmm. you know this flank is yes. being turned or whatever. And nothing, There's got to be stakes. Everything in the everything in the story, even especially in a short story, which is why I tend to enjoy writing more. Everything right. in that story has to be consistent with the theme and has to have some reason to be in the story, especially a short story. Yeah. You can't really waste a single word. I read stories, what you just said, sword fighting combat. I am bored after two sentences. When I have a sword fight with Darian and Blue, there's something happens. I've been a fencer. I try to have one move and then someone hits or they don't, and it's done because yeah. because that's <laughs> because it's not about the, it's the, it's about the conflict. It's not about the f- sword fight. It's about right. what's happening. Darian's trying. He's he's injured. He's he's so badly injured. He's right. woken up just in time to save Blue. He's about to faint, and he's so ill. He's ill, and he's about to faint. And and what he does is he uses that feeling that he's going to faint to fool his po- opponent into thinking he's weaker than he is. He actually starts to fall. Cursed his side, knocks the spear aside, draws his rapier along it, and stabs him and kills him, and then collapses, and that's he's he's done. Right, but that's, that's like a good fight. two sen- yeah, two sentences. <laughs> that's it's, a good fight. Yeah, I mean, and th- th- there is a place for. I mean, like think of um, 
The Princess Bride. Mm. The sword fight in The Princess Bride, the movie, is fantastic. I love it. But there's character going on. There's really but, witty repartee. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, in the, and in the book, which is every bit as good as the movie, if you haven't read the book, you really should. Um, I'm speaking to your, uh, your listeners. Um, the way the fight is described, it's, it has the same feeling as the book. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's beautiful. And, it's, and it's, it tells you all about Inigo's training. And it tells you all about the man in black's kind of way of being and everything. And it's basically, mm -hmm. it's, it's character exposition mm -hmm. through the medium of a sword fight. Right. That, that is great writing. That's, that's a great sword fight. Well, we could go on all day talking about that because that, yeah. that goes very deep into just... You know, people, I'm not a reductionist. Anybody that's listened to my show knows I'm a fan of mystery, and I believe that reality is something that can't be really, in the end, apprehended by a concept. And Lang uh, that's not what the brain is for. No, thank you. And the the brain is for functional things to function in the, <laughs> keep, the material realm. Keep, keep you alive to have children. Y yes, yeah. very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> to mate, yes, to mate, to mate, and and to fly, fight or flight or mate. And and when you get to these, trying to understand the meaning of life, and when you have these stories, that goes very deep. When you have a brilliantly written yeah. story, as, as I told someone, me and Ryan Harvey talked about this. A great story goes beyond what happens. Plot is, in in a sense, right. not the most important thing, or even not important in some stories. It is, and, and some some of the best stories don't really have a plot. No, they don't. And the words themselves. This is what people have lost because they don't respect poetry anymore. My first degree is an MA in English literature. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I'm I'm totally with you on the poetry and yes. the, but the, the words uh, themselves. Yes, the um, words themselves. Reading Shakespeare, reading great, and there's a lot of other great writers, poet, poets. It's the, the words themselves hold power that does not lie completely in the conceptual meaning. You, right. you can read a poem. That's why you have the sutras, and that's why you have the Japanese haikus. And you have, I've been reading Japanese poetry lately because I got this book that was like, and I had never read Japanese poetry that much before. And I tell you what, <laughs> I read some of these Japanese poems. They're like not, not more than three or four lines long. Then I would read the next poem by some European guy, and it's three pages. And I was like... He only needed the three or four lines the Japanese guy used, but it's that's the power of it to be able to say something, and that's what the haikus I guess represent those kind of things. Yeah. And I said sutras are, if people don't know, are really kind of like spiritual teachings, but they're in short phrases. And again, the meaning isn't just in the concept. It's not like oh, that's so clever. It's it's not that the words like a great painting. Yeah, it's, it's something to meditate on. Yes, it takes you beyond... Well, a great painting, as Joseph Campbell talked about, he talked about great art being a window to transcendence. Right. When you see a great painting, you read a great poem, you uh, read a great book, it leaves you a little speechless because it goes beyond words and it takes you to a place. And that's what... That place that we have talked about the show sometimes, that it's not a place, but it is a inner state that yeah. that is not can't be reached by thinking and that's what meditation that's why it really to me it resembles meditation great art does. and that's why some of the, some of the best the best sort of um non-fiction books and novels mm -hmm. i mean yes okay this it's a story it's a it's technically it's fiction mm -hmm. but there's there's more truth in it if it's well done right than there is in in non-fiction right it's because the brain works on story it's like the fundamental process by which we we deal with everything is the story yes yes um, and yeah and um the app app apprehension of like i said i think there's something there's something that's going on and a story represents something and that's why i love joseph campbell if you ever read joseph campbell the, yeah, the mythologist course. yeah it's like um the whole point is that it, it represents something at least like the novel and uh, you, you pare it down to the, the smallest part of a, a great poem to be, in a sense, the most concentrated, powerful thing like that. But even a novel, it, it represents something archetypal to the human experience. And that's why it rings as true, more true even than just some... That's to me, is the problem with the modern novel, or was, I think it's changing a little bit now, um, was that idea, the 20th century... The whole the kind of nihilistic thing, and the guy gets hit by the car at the end, and see how absurd life is, and it doesn't really tell you anything about the, the and the and, yeah. the and the slice of life. You know, the slice of life story was was suddenly held up above everything else as oh, this is the most truth. Is just the meanings of life. He goes to his job and he goes and he walks home. Blah blah blah. And it's like well, that doesn't well, necessarily it, it hold. It can be. It can be. It depends. Yes. It depends how it's done. Right. Like like um um. um 
I'm told totally like Kafka or someone. I mean, like there were right. great writers that could do that, but, the, but like, but that was stripped away to the point of where it's like, like, no, what's the truth is just that there's nothing and you go to work and you grind it down and you go home and that's that all isn't it is. Truth. No, it isn't. My life isn't like that at all. I agree. I, no, no, there's mine. If you're living, <laughs> you know what, if you're yeah, living exactly. your life like that, that's the problem. Then, then yes, then, <laughs> then, then yes, you don't deserve to be represented in art because you've completely <laughs> ballsed up the whole point of being alive. I agree with you completely. <laughs> well, you know, Van Gogh found more, yeah, I'm sure Van Gogh could find more truth in the potato eaters than he would in like a Wall Street guy or something. Not right. not to put down the, you know, the, the acquisition of money and the use of it in, in positive ways. There's a there's an art to that in itself. But but the point is the beauty and the mystery in life, and this goes back to very Zen things and to great art, I think, and in what Van Gogh painted and what some people wrote of Pablo Neruda or his poetry about, the simplicity of when I go for a walk. Uh, you know, you ri- you risk sound like a, sounding like a, a cheesy Hallmark card, but it's like I go for a walk and I stop, and I'm in L.A., Los Angeles, so the mm-hmm. flowers are insane. I mean, it looks like an old Star Trek episode. Sometimes you touch it because you think it's going to be plastic. <laughs> yeah. You see a flower or something, or I'll just see the grass and the sun shining through it, and I'll stop. Yeah, kids are great for that. Do you have kids? No, I don't, but I know I try to. Be, I just try to be like one. Because- right. Well, I have I have two daughters, mm-hmm. and you know when I'm walking with them, particularly when they were a bit, bit younger, we would often stop because they will have seen something that I would have been completely oblivious to, like maybe a bee on a flower, or or an odd looking insect crawling along, or something like that, mm-hmm. and they will stop mesmerized by it, mm-hmm. and. And so I stop and I see it and it turns out they're right. It is mesmerizing when you actually stop and look. And we spend our whole lives trying to get back to that wisdom. Children are considered naive. They are about some things. They're innocent. What they haven't, uh, what hasn't happened to them is they haven't been taught to be cynical. They haven't, uh, yeah. haven't, they haven't had the wonder beaten out of them. They haven't t- been told that all that matters is you have to make money and all this kind of stuff. Right. I mean, that, the truth of life. They haven't put up their filters. No, they haven't. And we, we, and and also living in the city again. Yeah, people put up so many filters just to block out the. They get uh, desensitized. There's so much noise, and you have to filter it out. But there's the whole thing in meditation. It's just an amazing thing. Of uh, and when I first heard it, I, I didn't understand it until I kind of moved deeper into it and, and started meditating and understanding this. I live in the middle of Los Angeles, but luckily there's a huge amount of greenery. I live in the hills. It's wonderful. And the idea of hearing, and this isn't something you do with the mind, of being able to hear the silence beneath the sound. Mm. That's a very Zen concept. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep spiritual meditational idea. It is something you can experience, but because silence has to do with inner silence peace so you can be in the middle of a city i mean there's people that are in jail that are freer that are people than people who have are rich you know because you can yeah, see sure. by their behavior it's sad it's you know they say it's sad that anybody is in jail or anybody's in those kind of positions but but there's people that are absolutely miserable look at anthony bourdain he was a he, right. he was a hero of mine he had everything he was rich not only was he rich and famous which most people want he he was he was uh, to put it crassly, he was banging Oz, Ozzy Argento, <laughs> I mean, you know, the Italian <laughs> right. movie star girlfriend, and he was right. doing fantastic work. He was a, you know what? I believe he was but a. He was ill. He was a great man. Yes, but he was ill. He was ill. And so, whatever situation you're in, it's like the the satisfaction, the happiness in life, it can't be provided by the by your surroundings, by those things, unless you can somehow connect with them. Somehow he was not able to connect anymore with those things you're talking about. Your daughters were able to see a bee on the flower, be mesmerized. Hmm. And when you're in that state, it's like when I dance, I'm a swing dancer. When I, All right, cool. Yeah, when I dance, and probably I would imagine when you sword fight, I felt this way when I went back and fenced a, about a year ago, and then I got injured and I, I decided I had... I. I couldn't do fencing and dancing. I just do it's too much because I'm already I do too much already. But but when I'm when I was when I was fencing, I was fighting for my life. You feel like you're fighting for your life when I'm dancing. Yeah, sure. When I'm dancing, when I see a sun, uh, nature, I get into it and I, and I stop concepting it. I stop calling everything by names. I'm I'm just there and I look at. I realize right. I'm looking at a tree and I realize I don't know what this thing is. When you stop trying to control it, you you, yeah. you reach that point where. A silence comes to you, and and when you're in that space, space, and when I say silence, you'd be in the middle of fencing, but inside, there's a stillness because you have to be focused. So um, you you can't be anxious or depressed when you're doing those things. There's no room because the that, the mind creates those things. Yeah. So for, for when I was writing these stories, you know, I started questioning myself when I because I loved 
uh, Conan, you know, and Faffer and the Gray Mouse, yeah, yeah. Faffer and the Gray Mouser, and Jack Vance's stories of the dying earth. I grew up in these things, and they, they were my entrance to, they were a spiritual doorway for me. The, sure. the fantasy stories to me opened up a sense of mystery, mystery and... It's, and they were, they were completely maligned. In their time as like yes. trash and rubbish and blah blah blah. Yes. And okay, to yeah. be fair, a, a, a lot of it was. Well, rubbish. yeah, yeah, yeah. But there, yeah. but within, but within that that ore, there is there is gold. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And, and so so when when I um, when I think what what breaks your mind open might be a completely different story to what breaks mine open. It's absolutely true. And there's people, yeah, and and that's the, something you have to be accepting with people. It's like that's another thing a whole another discussion of like people want always want someone else to like what they like the movies the, yeah, yeah. like the 13th war it, does, it everyone yeah. has a different entry like you said into that place where it has meaning to them don't malign that even some romance novel where the guy's got his shirt off and the woman there's the plantation in the background look I can't, it doesn't do anything for me but for some women maybe it's their it escape speaks, it speaks to a different sort of truth it's like yeah. it speaks to the truth of the underlying desire that the reader is feeling there's no harm in that no. And I think that if we are less judgmental, that's, you know, to get less judgmental, to be more empathic and realize that everyone feels differently, let them uh, have whatever they need to, it may be just a doorway to something deeper. Maybe they start reading romance fiction, then maybe they, they suddenly right. decide maybe I'll see a Shakespeare play. You know, it could be a, it's yeah. a nice gateway drug into something really wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of Harry Potter, particularly. Um, I have daughters and my daughter's loved harry potter um they still do but they're less into harry potter now because i just managed to convert them to star wars i am so <laughs> pleased about that um but but you know the thing is when we were having to read these very long books to them and i was like, oh god and eventually they kind of started reading them themselves and they were and, and the thing is as as a gateway drug to reading for pleasure harry potter is brilliant and you know what if I ever meet J.K. Rowling, I will give her a big hug. Mm -hmm. Because even though I don't, you know, her books aren't for me. Yes, yes, I understand. They have been hugely great for my kids. Snobbery is just a, is a form of fear. Quite. It's a form of fear and you want to have a form of control. I like this. Everything else sucks. And this is wonderful. That's just, you know, it's just so immature. Yeah, I had the same experience of Harry Potter, a friend of mine. I um felt the same way, you know, was not, didn't really have much respect for it and was not into it. And, and she told me how all these wonderful moral, she's a therapist and she told me all these wonderful mm -hmm. moral lessons and stuff and how her daughter was so into it. And that changed my opinion of it. I realized I have right. to, I had to drop, I wasn't like, I didn't hate it or anything, but I realized no. I have to drop my, I have to drop this attitude. It's just an ego thing. It's just, that's right. It just, and just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's not good. Exactly. And, oh, thank you. You know I what? Mean, I can't stand Bjork. I cannot stand Bjork. And you know what? I think she's one of the most talented people in the world. <laughs> there you, so it's, like, you can like, you cannot like something and still respect that. right it's like ballet you know ballet is not my thing when i watch people doing ballet i think oh my god that's so very difficult to do but why would you want to <laughs> I kind right? of feel the same, yeah. but 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 you know as a physical discipline i know enough about physical training to know that they are way stronger fitter more flexible than i am by mm -hmm. a million miles right and they are you know incredible athletes and performers it's an incredibly difficult discipline i just well it's like football i don't really understand why right. people would want to do it right oh well let me tell and to uh, before we move on I'll, I'll tell you something that the british one of the british commentators said on the last game he said when when england was playing um uh sweden <clears throat> yeah and he said at one point because they were saying if you have just tuned in the guy was saying, you may not believe the scoreline because England was winning 2 nothing because England's had this curse about the World Cup. They just can't seem right. to get farther than a certain point. And the other guy was like, well, wh who wouldn't be have tuned in by now? He goes, what? If you're, if you're reading, a, if you're off this place reading a book, you need to get a life. And I just, I, I laughed. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, was like, oh my God. I was like, there's got to be some press from that. That's in, the, in Great Britain, there's got to be some press from that comment because I was thinking most people would feel the opposite. They're thinking if you're watching a soccer game, you could be reading a book instead. Right. You could, you don't have a life, yes. but I understand it's important in the sense to the nation, but I just thought, I mean, I laughed. I just thought that was the most yeah. hilarious, ironic comment from a, from, <laughs> from someone that comes from the land of literature, you know, of like right. Shakespeare. Oh but, my. But yes. But he's a, but he's you a, know, but he's probably next, he's next footballer. He's next footballer. Right. <laughs> so he's like, and, and you know, if it's, if it's, if reading books isn't your thing, 
that's yeah. okay too. I, I agree. I you don't know, get it. Because well, I don't get it either. But you know, at a certain point, words are bullshit. My my, I have a, <laughs> a friend, a kind of hippie friend. He's like, man, language is words are bullshit, or language is bullshit. And and I, I understood what he's saying in a sense because language is conceptual. And right. you've got to be a really good writer to get past that. We were just talking about that, okay. the words do, and all do, that. Do you know what I did right after I graduated with my English literature MA? Mm -hmm. I worked as a cabinet maker for four years. Interesting. I was so fed up mm -hmm. of <laughs> being able to argue anything, take mm -hmm. any position and justify it, and basically mm -hmm. do well with that. Mm -hmm. I just needed something concrete, something physical, something where you cannot bullshit your way out of it. If you put mm. a chair together and you sit on it and you end up on the floor, that chair is a bad chair. You can't, you mm. can't, you know, quote Jacques Derrida and claim that it's a good chair. No, it's a bad chair if you can't sit on it. Right. And yet, right? You, yet you can use sophistry or, you know, right. false arguments. Yeah. And that the thing is like you argue from every point of view and then you realize you're standing back in the exact same place you were standing. You're the same person. Nothing's changed. Right. And that's like, well, if it doesn't change you, but that, that, but that's the great thing about historical swordsmanship, right? Because yes, it's based on literature. It's the written word mm -hmm. and, and drawn images are what we base our practice on. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the kind of the substrate. Um, but everything is done sword in hand in practice. Right. And if it doesn't work, if it can't stop you from getting hit in the face with a sword, it's clearly wrong. Right. That's a good, so there's good point. So that, there's that sort of... Um, bullshit filter on it yes and it's, yeah it's like two people sitting around like you said or that's what i get it's like i know that people are writing about writing these combats i can tell they they don't know i fenced and i can tell like i, I knew that liber had fenced when you read faffer and the gray mouser his sword, sword fights are very short and mm. and they're very like you said they're very clear they have something to do the story they have something to do the characters he never gets off on and if you you can read something and tell if somebody understands what combat is like Dashiell Hammett yeah. Dashiell Hammett who wrote the Maltese yeah. Falcon and then he goes it's like the, the continental op walks into a room somebody gets hit they're down done two sentences yeah. because that's how <laughs> yes. that's how violence is you don't yeah. you don't punch each other for fifteen minutes uh, well unless it's a boxing match and then and then that's that's. A different thing. Because yeah, because well, violence, violence is there's, there's a spectrum to it, mm -hmm. and what is again, it's a problem that we see where things that work beautifully in competitions don't work when somebody's trying to murder you. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and vice versa. And the thing is, mm -hmm. you know, if you're if you're trying to if you if your source material is dealing with somebody trying to murder you with a big sharp sword, mm -hmm. um, but then you test it only in tournaments then you're going to get a very skewed idea as to what the book is trying to tell you because a lot of the stuff that the book will tell you to do, you shouldn't do in a tournament. You're, you're going to get a, and, and when you're in the fight, you're going to get a very skewered idea. Right, of, exactly. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Talking about uh, going beyond words, uh, mm -hmm. going beyond concept, going, going beyond meaning, that brings me to kind of the last uh, question I want to ask is the sword, apart from being uh, a practical a tool, a weapon. Why the fascination with the sword from the time of the uh, ancient uh, days to Excalibur to to the to the lightsabers now? Like the sword has been held a fascination as a symbol. There are several related. There are several related theories there. Um, basically, one of the reasons why the sword is so iconic is because it's always been expensive. So it's. Mm. Only, only the the rich could use it. Now, peasants with spears do a pretty good job of killing people if they're trained properly. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, peasants have blades, you know, machete type things for clearing brush or whatever, which are not swords; mm -hmm. they're knives, right? Or sides. When it becomes, sorry, or sides exactly. When it becomes a sword, it is you have enough money that you can have this very expensive thing that's only job is to represent your status and represent power okay mm -hmm. and because it because of that because it's not the primary weapon it's not even the best weapon necessarily it's the symbolic weapon it's the thing it's the symbol of a warrior it's a sword that you know you use spears for hunting you use knives for day-to-day -day chores now okay by the the time of the high middle ages they're using swords for hunting as well but fundamentally the sword is originally a 
it's the one weapon that's just a weapon mm -hmm. and it's very expensive to make because there's a lot of metal it's the one weapon that's the only blade. it's the one weapon that's only weapon that's interesting mm -hmm. go ahead yeah um yeah i mean it'd be much more efficient just to have a you know the last four inches of the blade attached to a wooden hilt so you think so you think it you said the symbol of a warrior why do you think it is the symbol of a warrior? Because it is such a custom weapon. Because it, because it's 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 only any use for fighting with, and it's very expensive, and so it became a symbol of status and a symbol of power, and therefore it became attractive. When did it? When did um, it? Uh, when do you? When did it become so important? Because it existed in Roman times. Oh, it's it's okay. Think think of the Bible beating beating your swords into plowshares. The sword is already the symbol of a that's warrior. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Right. That's so it's true. at least a couple of thousand years old. The, that idea and it's probably a lot older right so it's it's always been the symbol of a warrior and even now like modern armies use them symbolically when they would never use them on the battlefield because it's still the symbol of a warrior and it has all this it, it kind of acquired all this spiritual um accretion I, I i don't think it's a coincidence that the time when the iconic european sword shifted from being a Viking type sword to being something that is clearly a cross, right? Was in the 11th century when Christianity swept Europe. Right, in the Crusades. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you have the sword is inextricably associated with whatever religion the knight happens to practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of Shintoism, like the three sacred objects of Shinto mm -hmm. as a sword, a mirror, and a, and a jewel, right? Um, a, so a sword, think, a mirror, and a jewel? And a jewel, I mm -hmm. think so. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly a sword. That's the bit I'm sure of. Um, like, and in Islamic culture, the um, the iconic sword is a scimitar, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, um, as as Islam spreads, so people tended to use curved swords because that's what swords are supposed to look like in that culture, right? Right? S um, because the, they they're it's like the crescent moon, which is an Islamic symbol, right? So the sword starts to look more like the, right. the crescent, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you have the the kind of the social status stuff. You have the spiritual religious symbolism associated with it, and all that together kind of trumps the fact that it's not necessarily the best weapon. Is it? Did it also become the symbol of kings from X from uh, the writing of uh, the 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 myth of King Arthur, or before that? You think? Um, I, I about kings, I'm not so sure because actually, you know, there is a sort of state. But yeah, I mean, Excalibur is just one of many magical swords in in European surely, surely the most famous, history. right? Oh yeah, sure. Um, but not necessarily because it was worn by a king. It was because it was invested with the very essence of kingship by being stuck in a stone. Uh, yeah, and what's, uh, well, and it's complicated. Does is the sword thrown away then, and then the Lady of the Lake has? Uh... Yeah, well, it's returned to the Lady of the Lake. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. Has it? Uh, obviously, it's yeah. It's more than a sword. That's the whole point. I was just yeah. I was just curious about that being such a powerful enduring myth, and of course, you know, before uh mallory wrote it it was you know it has much earlier origins but yeah. I, but I, th I think excalibur existed even in the earlier ones did it not i think so yeah it's yeah. and the notion of of particular weapons being invested with particular spiritual powers is is you know common and ancient i mean it's it's basically the same sort of thinking that produces um religious relics yeah, I was trying to remember, I was trying to remember if there was a magical weapon that existed in historical and myth or anything before excalibur and I don't know in the in the Greek myths, but usually it was the god was yeah. investing the person directly, weren't they? Or was there a weapon? Um, oh, now you're asking. Yes, it's a good question, and I, I, I I'm I'm okay. I can't think of an example, but I bet you there is one. That's something for for our listeners to look up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Seriously, that's something to look up, especially you fantasy fans. Maybe some people know. I mean, I think some people aren't as well read in myth, myth, myth as they should be. Myths are fascinating. Uh, Joseph Campbell's a good entry to that to read about myths. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, of course, most people that are real big fantasy fans and literature fans have read Gilgamesh. He doesn't. There's no magical weapon in that, and that's the earliest. That's the earliest tale we have. But I, I want to look okay. and see because uh, there there was you know the. Usually the Greek in the Greek myths, it was usually the the gods were almost investing them their personality into a person. They would enter, yeah. And I can't remember if there was ever a weapon, but I'm going to look 
that up. There was the wings of Icarus. Ah, man, that's a good question. Okay, well, there's something, <laughs> there's always good to leave a little mystery. There we go. Yeah, sure. Um, well, guys, thanks so much for being on the show. This has been, uh, it's uh, been my pleasure. Oh, I feel like we could just go on for so long. Let's, let's, <laughs> yeah, let's seriously, go it's, it's so Maybe deep. we should do it again. Yes, we should. I mean, you know, I did a two parter on the golden age of science fiction. I feel like the, um, this, there, I have to think of a set of a, a follow up um, because I think there's something, place to go. Maybe it'd be magical weapons. Maybe that would be the sure. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Maybe. so so let's close with tell me about um just give me a, just give me some links to your sites and the and the, talk about the books you've read a little bit or the, the, you, that you've written the I'm books sorry. I've written um okay um well the the place to find me online is my website guywindsor dot com um and there you know I have all of my books and stuff listed um, my my latest thing that if if your if your listeners are interested in uh, how to write sword fights. I've actually got a book that includes instruction on that called Sword Fighting for Writers, Game Designers, and Martial Artists, which uh, oh, might be interesting. That's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you. Please, li please listen to him on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For, for a more sort of general overview of what historical martial arts are and how they work, um, I've just this year published a book called The Theory and Practice of Historical Martial Arts. And you can find links to all of those on my website. Well, I need to read those. Those are fascinating ideas. Would you be, uh, could someone, would you be available for hire if someone wanted to send you a, a, a battle scene or a fight scene and have you consult on oh, sure. accuracy? Yeah, I, I, I consult on, on various, you know. So you writers out there, I think that's a, that would be a great idea to read his books, but also uh, that'd be a great feedback. Um, find out how much, much he charges, send a scene and it could improve your, your novel or sure. your short story vastly. Hopefully make it much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean because my background's in literature so mm -hmm. you know for me it's all about what's the story doing and mm -hmm. what is the fight why is the fight there right. and what's it supposed to do well you sound like a great um, you sound like a great a perfect editor for that kind of thing then for this genre so again yeah thanks so much for being on the show and um, well, thank you Robert. it's been lovely talking to you yeah and i'll be in touch and maybe we can do a follow-up and until then uh keep your guard up <laughs> thanks <laughs> all right mate take care Oh, what a delightful chat. Yeah, really nice guy. Yeah. So, Edgar, where were we when we were so politely interrupted? Um, I think we were right here. Ha! Ah, ha, ha. Not even close. Round two. On guard! Ha! <laughs>